Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, lovely for you to come and join our discussion tonight um, or about unheard stories from the past. Uh, we're all historical novelists. Um, I'm here tonight with Polly Crosby, um, who's going to introduce herself in a little while and what she's written. Um, Caroline Bishop, uh, Louise Hare, and Francis Quinn. Um, so tonight's discussion really is about um, lesser heard voices from the past um, or times which haven't so much been written about and um, our experiences of, of writing um, these uh, unheard voices. Um, I, I'm gonna introduce myself first. Um, I'm Louise Fine. Um, I've written two, two novels. Uh, the first one is out already, uh, People Like Us. Um, this is set in 1930s Leipzig and it's a little bit unusual because it is told from the perspective of a young girl um, who has been brainwashed into Nazism. So in uh, the unusual aspect is that it's told from a young girl's perspective and uh, also almost from the perspective of the enemy. Um, I'm also going to be talking about my new novel, which is uh, called The Hidden Child, which is out in September. Um, and this is set in the 1920s and features the uh, eugenics movement, which was very widespread in the 1920s. And it's about a couple who very much support the movement um, until they have a child who turns out not to be perfect. Uh, so we'll chat about that a bit later. And um, over to Polly, if you can introduce yourself and your novel. Hi, I'm Polly Crosby. Um, I've written two novels. Uh, the first one, The Illustrated Child, came out last October and it's out in paperback in July. Uh, the second one is called The Unravelling and it's out in September. Um, the Unravelling is a historical novel set in 1927 and the present day. Um, I don't have a copy of it yet because it hasn't yet been printed, but here's a picture of a very pretty cover. Um, it's about a young woman who accepts a job as a PA to a butterfly collector on a wild, mysterious island in the North Sea. Um, and it's about what happens to her and what she unravels when she goes to the island. That's amazing. Uh, Caroline, um, can you introduce you and your novel? Uh, yes, I'm Caroline Bishop, and this is my novel, The Other Daughter, uh, which came out in February. Um, and it's a dual timeline novel, so part historical. It's partly set in 2016 and partly set in 1926. Um, and it tells the story of a woman, um, Jessica, who discovers a big secret about her birth, um, which really rocks her life um, and messes with a lot of things up to her. And she decides that in order to figure out her life again and find out more about this, she has to go to Switzerland, uh, where her mother spent time 40 years previously, um, and just needs to figure out exactly what happened to her while she was there. Um, and the setting, the background to all this, is the uh, women's liberation movement of the 1970s, um, because women in Switzerland then got the vote at national level, level in 71. So I really explore what happened after that and all the other rights that were still to come. Brilliant, thank you. And Louise? Hi, um, I'm Louise Hare, and this is my novel, This Lovely City, uh, which came out last year, but it's now out in paperback, and I should just do my little sales pitch. It is currently 99p on Kindle, if you are an ebook reader, um, but it's set in 1948 and 1950 in South London, and it's um, sort of a Wimrush era, part murder mystery, part love story about a couple called Laurie and Evie, um, and how they deal with um, the sort of the, the ramifications of a murder um, that happens near where they live. Brilliant, thank you. And Francis? Hi, I'm Francis Quinn. Uh, this is my book, The Smallest Man, uh, which came out in January. It's set in 17th century England, and it tells the story of Nat Davy, who's a boy with dwarfism, and he's sold by his family and becomes a court dwarf at the court of Charles I, um, basically given, the, given to the Queen as a present, given as a kind of human pet, but he strikes up a quite unlikely friendship with the Queen, and that takes them on a journey that will go through the turbulent years of the of the Civil War. And since we're doing sales pitches, mine is also just 99p for the Kindle edition <laughs> for the whole month of May. Yeah, I should maybe have said as well that um, 
I think the links for all of our books, if you're interested, are um, on the um, Stay at Home website, like all the books featured in the festival. Um, and actually, my book is also <laughs> <laughs> all around um, <laughs> not yours <laughs> um, so yeah what I find fascinating um, about all of your books is that they um, they do feature some quite unusual things which perhaps um, a lot of people wouldn't have known about so um, uh, Caroline I knew absolutely nothing about the women's lib movement in Switzerland and um, when I think of Switzerland it's all you know the postcard sort of skiing or chocolate or you know the the that aspect which um which is clearly um not the real history of the place um and Louise again your book um set in in just after the war there's a lot about London during the war and about obviously um, people coming over on the Windrush. Um, it tells a story of London that, that I hadn't really ever seen before. Um, and France is, yeah, a really fascinating time in history, which um, especially about a dwarf at that time, um, really unusual. Um, and Polly, obviously your book isn't out yet, so I haven't read it and I can't talk about it in any great detail, but it's actually um, so what, what drew you to, to write about, um, you know, these, these actually quite unusual points of history? And I'll start with Louise. So the sort of kickoff for this story was um, there were these tours that you, well, you can't do at the moment, but you will hopefully be able to do again soon. Um, run by, I think it's the London Transport Museum and it's called Hidden London. Um, and a lot of what they do is they go into sort of old um, tube stations that are currently closed. So I've been into like Oldwich, which they use a lot for filming, and I've been in the tunnels underneath Euston. And they do one to Clapham South, which there's a deep level shelter underneath Clapham Common, basically, which I knew had been used as an air raid shelter. But when we got, she got down there and it, you know, it's very surreal and very disorienting because you can hear the tube trains, but then you've got all these, they've sort of got it set up with bunk beds so you can sort of imagine people what it must have been like to sort of try and sleep under there and like the conditions. Um, and then they had these pictures of um, windrush passengers and I had never realized that that was a place that they sort of used as a, a sort of hostel to put up windrush passengers um, when they first arrived if they didn't have somewhere immediately to go to. Um, and I just started thinking about what that must have felt like to sort of come all this way, land in a completely um, strange country and then to get sort of shift them to ground in this like horrendous noisy environment um so the novel actually started with a short story about this guy laurie and his his first day and him sort of going why have i why have i come here <laughs> so um so yes yeah, so it was part of even i knew about rumors it was that sort of little hidden part that i was like oh that sort of sparked the idea brilliant thank you and uh francis what about you well, I sort of stumbled upon my story, really. I was researching a novel um, set in the time of the Great Plague. It was going to be a murder mystery. And I, I had the idea to include a character with a disability because I thought they'll bring a different perspective, particularly at that time. They would have been quite on the edges of society. And so I was Googling around 17th century attitudes to disability and I found the story of Geoffrey Hudson, who was the inspiration for my character, Nat Davy. And he was a real person. He was a boy with dwarfism who was probably sold by his family, but either way ended up as a court dwarf and had the most incredible life. And I was just really impressed by the fact that this guy had been handed quite a difficult hand in life. I mean, it would be quite difficult now, let alone then. And he'd grabbed all his opportunities and made something of them. And I thought, you don't get many disabled characters in literature still and you particularly don't get them in popular fiction you might get them in very highbrow very earnest books and I didn't want to write a book like that I wanted to write a book that was a good story and that would be fun and I thought well why not put someone in with a disability and see see the world through their eyes brilliant and and it works really well having read it it's great <laughs> Um, and um, Caroline, what about you? Um, well, mine, I guess, was um, inspired because I, I live in Switzerland. I moved here in 2013. Um, 
And I think, like you, Louise, I didn't know a great deal about the women's rights uh, movement in Switzerland. I, I think I knew that women got the vote quite late, 71, but I didn't really know anything else about it. Um, and when I moved here, I started working for um, a news website, uh, which is aimed at English speakers here. Um, and because of that, I was reading the Swiss news a lot and really getting to, it was a really good way to get to know the country and the issues that people were talking about. Um, and there were quite a lot, I suppose, of issues related to women's rights in the news at the time, things like pay equality, there was um, the Women's March, um, well, the Worldwide Women's March, and in 2017, I went to the one in Geneva. And there were just a lot of things that um, I realised were sort of still issues, I guess. Um, and so I started looking into it more and discovering what happened after that 71 vote. Um, because I guess I should say that Switzerland quite complicated politically, but basically every change to the law um, has to be voted on, so there's a referendum. So basically in 71, all the men voted to give women the vote. That's how it happened. And while I say all, it was about, I don't quote them, but something like two thirds. <laughs> so a third still said no. Anyway, so I started looking into this, um, what happened afterwards, um, and realised things like maternity leave came really late, something in 2004, um, and the right to request an abortion was very late. So there were a lot of a lot of um, rights that came much later in Switzerland than they did in the UK. Um, I guess I just found that really interesting. And then there's a second issue in my book um, related to the plot, which is sort of related, um, which is that Switzerland has a um, historical policy of um, putting children in care, um, but sort of forcing them into care for not always the right reason. Uh, and this policy sort of lasted throughout the 20th century up till about 79, 80. Um, and these children, some of them had a positive experience, but some of them were treated really badly. And this is another thing that was in the news when I was first moved here. And there was a story in exhibition about it, um, so I went to see that. And um, I think the government apologised in 2013 so it was in the news and then the survivors were given uh, compensation. So again, these are just issues that were really interesting to me, things that I thought were not that well known outside of Switzerland. And so I decided to incorporate these into my book. Brilliant, thank you. And Polly, I'd love to hear more about your inspiration because I can't wait to read your book, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, it all started, I suppose, I'm a, I'm a girl from Suffolk um, and I currently live in Norfolk. So that part of East Anglia has been in my blood and I love everything about the landscape around here, the wide skies, the flatlands. Um, my novel is set on an island that I actually made up because I wanted to take pieces from history and put it into a rounded, beautiful story, I suppose. Um, being a Suffolk girl, I knew a lot about history from these parts. And one thing that I was fascinated by um, was the herring fishing trade. Uh, I lived right by the sea and would always see the boats go out. And um, there are women from Scotland back in the turn of the century up until the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, who came down from Scotland following the herring migration. And sometimes they would only be 16 years old when they left their families to work for the herring trade. And they used to have to gut and salt the fish in the coldest of winters um, with for very little pay in awful conditions. And it just made me think, I didn't know enough about it and I wanted to find out more. Um, the other thing that I was really interested in with my novel was the idea of um, collecting butterflies, lepidoptery. Uh, because nowadays it's it's really frowned on and it's, it's a horrible thought pinning butterflies and I wanted to know where it had come from and what happened to it and what happened to the people that did it and um, I realised that it was mostly men with lots of wealth that went all over the world to collect incredible specimens and then I found a woman in Norfolk who was actually a, a great lepidopterist and I just thought it's a real gender thing, both of these things. We've got the herring girls who are doing the most horrendous work for very little pay. And then we've got the more wealthy women not able to do what they want to do because they can't go out on their own and collect the butterflies. So that's that's where it began really. Fantastic, thank you. And um, 
yeah so you've all come up with these really unusual things which is brilliant um my own um sort of inspiration actually have both been from family issues um my first book really was inspired by my father coming to the UK as a refugee from Nazi Germany and I suppose it was something I wanted to explore but as I did my research I just wanted to really understand how a nation could a civilized nation could be in a really few short years um, brainwashed into this horrendous um, ideas that just seem so awful and um, I felt the most powerful way to do that was to tell the point of view from another person and um, and doing that I had to sort of yeah I became immersed in a, in a Nazi world for about two years so I'm very happy to, to be out of that. Um, and for my second novel, it's because I had a child with um, a severe form of epilepsy as, as a small girl. And um, had she been born a hundred years ago, she would have been locked away in an ep epilepsy colony for the rest of her life. And that got me thinking about, you know, um, what would happen, uh, what was life like for those people that we never, hear about because it's a, a part of history that's shoved under the carpet all the asylums everyone knows about them the epilepsy colonies um but not really in any detail it's a sort of forgotten history um and also our part in the eugenics movement which was so widespread in the early part of the 20th century so that was really my motivation but for all these issues um it's quite interesting how you gathered your research for them because they're not always that easy to, to discover. There's, you know, not always stuff written down. So I'd love to know how you all went about that. Um, and I, you've all started with the beginning idea, but that's not enough for a book. So what do you do next? <laughs> so again, I'll start with you, Louise. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'm quite lucky that, um, for this novel, I was only going back to sort of 1948, 1950. So it was actually not too difficult. And because I think historians um, are quite interested in that sort of post-war period when we're sort of coming out of rationing. So it's quite easy to find um, that sort of information. And then because my book set mainly set in Brixton and, and Clapham, um, and I lived near there, the Black Cultural Archives were great because I could go there and get um, information and read first person accounts um, and I just sort of really used that and also fiction some really good fiction that was written at the time from people that came from the Caribbean and I sort of used that to with what I sort of thought people you know this, my characters would feel and you know to see if those two things sort of um, coincided and I found luckily they did um, and then yeah I just I think I got quite lucky that there were, it was you know with the the Wimmer scandal happening as well, there suddenly became this influx of new books. So when I was editing, there was suddenly all this new research that came out and I could sort of grab new information and see if I could fit it in. Um, so yeah, it went from me searching for stuff to suddenly every week a new book coming out, which was sort of odd, but um, yeah. Good timing. <laughs> yeah, well, horrible, horrible timing, but yeah, convenient. <laughs> that's a better word <laughs> yeah okay and um what about you Francis well obviously I had quite a lot of historical events to fit in but they they involve quite a lot of research but they weren't they weren't difficult there are lots of books about the civil war there are lots of books about Charles I and Henrietta Maria but there's very very little about what it would be to be like to be someone with dwarfism at that time there's, there is a biography of Geoffrey Hudson, who was the inspiration for Nat. So I use that, but that's stitched together from sources. And it's very much about events that we know happened in his life. It's not about how he felt or how people reacted to him. So what I did was try and find out as much as I could about people living with dwarfism now, because I thought the condition hasn't changed. And some of the attitudes would be different. I mean, I don't think anyone thinks these days that if you've got dwarfism, you're cursed. 
but they still think, for example, that you're small and weak and perhaps incapable of having a you know useful life. So I followed a few people on Twitter, I read autobiographies and just tried to get an insight into what it would be like to be in that situation where when people look at you, they see one thing very obviously. It's not, it's not like a lot of disabilities can be hidden, which has its own problems, but at least it does mean someone can get to know you before they know about that disability. But with dwarfism, you've got no hiding place. That's what people are going to see first, and that's the judgment they're going to make. So I was trying to work out how it would feel and how you might be able to change people's minds, because that's what Nat tries to do. Nat tries to show people he's exactly the same on the inside as everybody else, and he can have a useful life, and he has the same thoughts and feelings as other people. And, and that, that's the thrust of the book in many ways, that he's showing we are all the same on the inside. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. And Caroline, what about you? Um, well, I guess these issues, even though um, I don't think they're too well known outside of Switzerland, within Switzerland, there's, there's no secret about them. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information available, um, a lot of information online, government information about women's rights and, and the liberation movement. Um, I went to the library and read lots of books um, about it, which had sort of first personal accounts of uh, what happened back then um, and documentaries as well um, information to look at there um, yeah and then in terms of the, the foster placement issue um, I think like I said there was a touring exhibition out here um, which was really fascinating because it had um, first person testimonials from people who went through this who were taken from their families with um, kids and what happened when they were on their placement so um, quite harrowing at times, but really fascinating to listen to. Um, and because this, I think for quite a long time, that was was kind of a secret, or at least not talked about here. But then in recent years, um, since sort of 2010 or so, it's been talked about a lot more and recognised as a societal wrong. Um, so there's a lot more information out there. And um, I read a book that had also first person testimonials in there. Um, and the person who wrote that was part of some research, a research project that was done afterwards to sort of analyse why this happened and to stop similar issues happening again. Um, yeah, I've seen lots of lots of fiction as well and um, a brilliant film about the 71 votes. So yeah, that's quite a lot. So bringing in Switzerland definitely helped. <laughs> definitely, and because um, this job I had, I, I'm not there anymore, but uh, when I was working for this news website, I was sort of, before I even started writing the book, I was researching the similar topics um, because I was writing articles for, for the website about women's rights and anti anniversary of the women's vote and things like that. So it was sort of already in there, in me before I started properly researching. Great. And um, Polly, is there much in the way of information about the Herring Girls that you could find? Well, interestingly, there was when I looked hard enough. Um, Norfolk and Suffolk are famous for their wonderful museums and the Time and Tide Museum in Great Yarmouth is all about the herring trade and, and work on the coast. And the things that I found there that have found their way into my novel were just brilliant. I mean, that museum has a huge original smokery, I think you would call it, where they uh, smoke, would have smoked the herring and they've got this scent drifting through the museum. So as you walk around, you're sort of sniffing going, it smells a bit fishy around here. And then you get to it and this woof, this great blast of smell comes at you. And it really sends you right back to the time when they would have smoked them. Um, with regard to, to butterflies and lepidoptery, uh, Norwich Castle Museum was wonderful. They've got an incredible selection of um, butterflies and uh, old taxidermy and all kinds of fascinating things. And that's where I discovered um, the female lepidopterist that gave me the ideas for the unravelling. Um, one other thing that really caught my interest when I was trying to devise an island that would hold all of these intricate things together. Um, I used to live near Orford Ness, which is a spit of land off the Suffolk coast. And it's really 
unusual. It's got a lot of history on it from the war, um, from the Cold War and from times long before that. And all these layers built up and just got my brain whirring. So that was probably one of the main things that drew everything together for me. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And actually, um, local resources are amazing um, because they they do they are these sort of unusual smaller pieces of history unlike national museums where you know all the big things are recorded but um, I used um, my local uh, Surrey History Museum um, it's not a museum actually it's a centre um, where they hold a lot of records and I was able to um, access um, all the case books um, which belong to the asylums and the epilepsy colonies that were open in the area and um, so that was a great resource for not only just um, about the people but also the attitudes of the people caring for them because it was it was actually really harrowing to read because a lot of it was at best matter of fact and at worst you know downright cruel the way they thought about you know these people and um and as I read through um and they went down to tiny tiny children um I felt like I needed to really give each one a bit of an airing and really look at their photographs and and make them feel like they were a little bit loved because that was really lacking through the pages of of the material I wrote and actually I found it quite disturbing the whole the whole process but really good resources in in those local places um and so okay you've got your research you're writing your book how um how important do you feel um it is to be um obviously it's important to be historically accurate but how much did imagination take over and how much um, is um, based on, on reality. And I know some of you have used real characters. I've used some real characters in my book, Francis, you obviously have. Um, but yeah, it just fascinates me how much has to be um, real. <laughs> so uh, Louise, do you want to kick off? I know in your book, I, won't, I don't want to give any um, any anything away but there's a there's something that happens was that was that a real event I don't want to say too much <laughs> I mean the main I guess the main sort of event that kicks the book up is a murder and that is not based on anything real although lots of people have asked that question so hopefully I've pulled it off in making it realistic <laughs> um, but yeah I mean the book's you know it's completely fictional in terms of the characters and what happens but I have used, um, because there's quite a lot of, you know, times when race comes into it and the, the right instance of racism. Um, and sometimes I've used things that happen to me or happen to my brother, people that I know. Um, so I think those things I really, it was quite cathartic to put those into the book and sort of, you know, just like almost like therapy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the plot line definitely is completely, completely made up. <laughs> just want to make sure everyone realizes that. <laughs> Yeah, but but by blending it with the sort of attitudes of the time, it feels very realistic. So that's that's what you want to achieve, and it is fiction, isn't it? It is, and it's it's quite interesting as well because I think you know, obviously I've said like I use a lot of my own sort of experiences, but I remember reading early reviews and people were like, oh, I'm so glad this is all in the past, and I was like, it's not that far in the past. Um, but then interestingly, after what happened in sort of April, May last year, people started to realise that this stuff was still happening. It's actually not as historical as I think some early readers thought it was. You might not have experienced those things themselves. So, yeah, it's been quite an interesting process over the last year to see how sort of people um, received the novel and how that's changed. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I love writing historical fiction, because there are so many parallels and actually attitudes don't change as quickly as we'd like to think they do and by bringing all those things out it just highlights what's going on today as well so yeah um Francis yeah I mean exactly as you've said one of the things that really surprised me when I was 
you know, I was looking at people now who have dwarfism was, yeah, we think attitudes have changed and no one's telling them they're cursed. But th there was one guy that I follow on Twitter and he would regularly get videoed. He'd just be walking down the street with his partner and people would call out names and they would film him and God knows what they were doing with the videos. And there was so much of that, that really, as Louise said, we think attitudes have changed, but they really haven't as much as you think. And so I suppose for me, because I was dealing with a real person in the beginning, in the beginning, I was going to make it Jeffrey Hudson's story. He was going to be the main character. But then I felt like I did need to use my imagination quite a lot. So, for example, as I said, he's given to the Queen as basically a human pet. But they're still 20 years later, once you know the Civil War is in its height, she's gone off to Holland to get troops for the, for the king. He's still with her. He's with her through all sorts of things. So I thought, well, there must have been more to this than the human pet relationship. Something must have happened. And there was clearly no kind of love relationship. So I thought, well, it, there must have been a friendship there. There must have been a relationship of trust. So I had to kind of use my imagination to think how that might have arisen. And the conclusion that I came to was she was, she was 15 when she married Charles I. She was French, she spoke hardly any English, she was Catholic, everybody hated the Catholics. So she had the most horrendous time. And I thought, well, maybe he's away from his family, he's been torn from his family, he's homesick, she's homesick, they're both lonely. And maybe that's where the relationship came from. We'll never know, but that is the joy of historical fiction that you can fill in the gaps in your own way. Definitely, yeah, for sure. And um, and Caroline, I'm sure there are still a lot of issues around women and, and rights in Switzerland because it really wasn't that long ago that all this happened. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think like everyone else has said, that was what was really interesting for me and um, why I think I wanted to write this because I perhaps I didn't realise it at the time is that I felt so many of those issues from the past that still resonating today I mean, I mean quite recently there was um, a women's strike here about striking about the gender pay gap and other things um, which was only just approved two weeks maternity leave maternity leave was quite short and there's still quite a lot of issues and I guess I was seeing that in my friends as well friends who have had kids and you know military places were too expensive or the mother felt like she couldn't either couldn't go back to work or had to go back to work and then couldn't afford the nursery and it, I just felt like there were so many themes that um, still resonated today um, but in terms of the fact of fiction um, my, like Louise said my characters are basically all fictional my, my sort of main point of view characters um, but there's so much sort of historical context in there that I wanted to be accurate so I mean I kind of do myself it's went a bit crazy because there's so many sort of laws and things that I need to fact check and make sure I was saying things correctly because I wanted to make sure that that was really um, accurate, both in terms of Switzerland and also in the UK because and my my um, story sort of followed um, Sylvia, who's Jessica's mother, who's a journalist in the UK, and it, it sort of follows issues that um, are happening in the UK as well as Switzerland. So things like the Equal Pay Act and return to leave and discrimination laws and things there. Um, yeah, so I wanted to make sure all that was accurate, but I also really wanted to sort of have that freedom that fictional characters give me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, I think it's about finding that balance, isn't it? And I've never done this before. <laughs> My first time at writing in historical fiction, so um, hopefully I've got that right. But, yeah, the reader can decide. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. And Polly, I mean, you've obviously made your island fictional, which which is sounds great. Um, so, yeah, how have you dealt with that balance? Um, well, like some of the panellists here, I haven't got anyone who was actually in our history as such. But I think it's so important to take fact as your starting point, because as a writer, my favourite thing is to to create, to build on, on foundations. And without that fact, I wouldn't have been able to create rounded characters that were authentic to their time, I suppose. Um, 
with the herring girls, there, there's not much um, information directly from them. Quite often in, in these historic records, it's people talking about them, quite often males talking about females. And um, I was more lucky with the butterfly collector because um, Margaret Fountaine, who was the a butterfly collector in Norfolk wrote diaries and published books, which is obviously very unusual for the late 1800s. And um, it was lovely to see that side of lepidoptery because so often it's it's men doing it, men making the uh, um, lepidoptery clubs that were men only. And so I had the basics, but I needed to add to that to make sure I got the the right feel of these characters. Brilliant. It remind your uh, the idea slightly reminds me of another book that was written about a woman um, um, who collected fossils on the Jurassic Park. Uh, and I'm going to embarrass. It's, my a, it's a Tracy Chevalier book, isn't it? That's but I can't it. remember the name either. Remarkable creatures. Yeah, yeah. Very and that, similar time period, I think. So there were some women who. Yeah. Wrote and did do that and um and yeah they had they had a tough time competing with with all the men as still some happened <laughs> uh, and, um, but yeah and um but for, for for me I have sort of blended real people with fiction and um I, I sort of I, I, my main character in um, The Hidden Child, or one of my main characters in The Hidden Child is based on a real factual person, but I've changed his name because I've strayed a bit too far from, um, from reality, a little bit like you, Francis. I didn't give him his real name in the book. Um, I have given some other people their real names in the book, um, but they're more minor characters. And I think, I think, yeah, if, if you're going to write about a real person, you have to be stick very much to the truth if you're going to use their real name. Um, but um, I very much adhered to the attitudes that he had and the attitudes at the time. Um, so as everyone else has said, I think um, it has to be authentic. It has to be uh, if you're going to put facts in there, they have to be correct. But with within that framework, you can use your imagination, and um, and that's important. We're writing fiction after all, so so yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to remind any people watching, you can ask questions. We've got a few on here already, um, but um, yeah, do do jump in with some questions. Um, I'm just going to ask everyone and something else before we move on to the questions, which is, um, did you find anything surprising um, during your, um, your sort of journeys and your, your research um, that you weren't really expecting to find? Um, and I'll start with Holly this time. Um, yeah, I did actually. Um, the island that I've written about, the family that own it are silk makers. Um, and so I had to learn all about the process of silk cultivation. And um, I read that silkworms, when they become silk moths, although they have wings, they can't actually fly because um, we have bred them over so many hundreds of years that they have no use to fly anymore. So they just mate and die, which I thought was surprising and, and very sad <laughs> for them yeah amazing <laughs> thank you and what about you Caroline I think for me although the book is very much about women's rights in Switzerland um I researched a lot about the, what was going on at the same time in the UK and um various things surprised me actually that even though in terms of the legislation the UK was ahead of Switzerland there's still lots of discrimination going on. Um, yeah. In fact, I discovered, I think I knew this before, but looked more into it, that there was um, quite a famous journalist bar in London called uh, El Elvino, I think, which the, the guy who ran it um, really had a thing against women, and he wouldn't let women go to the bar to order their drinks. They had to sit at a table and be served, whereas men 
to go and stand at the bar and order. So, of course, the men would go and gossip at the bar and get all the latest suits and find out what's going on in Fleet Street. And the women had to sit at the back and wait for their drinks. So, and there was a big couple of female journalists ran a campaign to overturn this. And eventually it, it did get overturned. But, yeah, I found that really interesting. Gosh. And when, when was that? In the 70s or...? Yeah, I think it was quite, it went to court, don't quote me, but I think early 80s. So yeah, throughout the 70s, it was, yeah, technically, you couldn't buy your drink at the bar. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um, uh, Francis, anything that you found out? Yeah, I think it's, it's funny little details that you find out. So um, after Queen Henrietta Maria, she goes, she goes off, the Civil War started, she goes off to Holland, she gets arms and men for the king, they come back and they land in Bridlington and they're there overnight and they come under bombardment from parliamentarian ships. So they've got shells firing at them and they, they basically run off to go and find a safe place. And she realises she's left her dog behind and she runs back for her dog. And, you know, when you read things like that, you just, that's what makes you realise these were people, even the kings and queens were people and, you know, did the same kind of things that, I think probably of those of you that I know might do that for your cat. <laughs> I do it for my dog as well, just to say. <laughs> Brilliant. And Louise, how about you? Um, yeah, I used to, I was doing a lot of research around um, London because obviously I could walk around a lot of my setting, but it wasn't always, you know, it didn't always look the same as um, it would have done at the time that my book was set. Um, and I was trying to find a venue for... Um, so Laurie, my main character, is in a band, and I was trying to find a venue for the band to play on, like, a Friday night. Um, and I really love theatre, and so I just found, fell on this sort of rabbit hole of um, research into the Lyceum um, Theatre, which is where they've had the Lion King on for, like, the last 15 or 20 years. Um, and it is, you know, as a theatre, the building that's been there for a couple of hundred years at least, you know, having, it's gone through all these different um, stages. And at that point, it was actually more of, like, a music hall. I think it's been, like, a bingo hall at times. It's been, like you know, had all these different guises, but I just loved that I could sort of put, you know, a building that I know quite well, that I've walked past so many times in the book, but have it have a different purpose. So that was quite nice. Brilliant. I love, I love all those rabbit holes you can end up going down and, um, and yeah, you can, you can totally go off track. Um, yeah. And, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to move on to some of the questions that we've had in and, um, First one from Penny Batchelor. Um, as writers, how do you deal with subjects and attitudes that were acceptable in the historical period you were covering, but are abhorrent today? Hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going to kick off because um, both of my books, that is quite applicable. And um, I honestly think that it's really good not to sort of sanitize history. Um, so you've got a modern readership and I know from some of the reviews of my books that they found it quite difficult to stomach some of the attitudes at the beginning of the, the book. Um, but I think it's really, really important to be accurate because, um, otherwise how do we, how do we sort of learn from history? And it also makes you question your own thoughts and beliefs and, I know that when I was looking into the whole brainwashing aspect of, of young people, um, it made me really think about what, how I talk to my children and how we all, we all brainwash our, our children and each other to an extent, because we listen to each other's opinions. And so, um, so I, I think it's important to, to be as realistic as, as possible. That's my answer. How, how about anyone else? jump in I think I, I was quite lucky really in the sense that though the the abhorrent attitudes were directed towards my main character and we are seeing everything through his eyes so I never felt as though anyone would feel I was adopting those views whereas I think what you you did with both your books was you had us see through the eyes of people who might have abhorrent views and, and you did it really cleverly. I think that's 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 equally valuable because it's, it's sometimes it's those people that we need to understand. It's mm -hmm. easy to understand the people we can sympathize with. 
that's true that's true and what about you Louise because obviously as you were saying it became quite current when, when you you were writing your book so that must have been quite painful yeah I mean it's, it's quite interesting because I mean obviously there is racism in the book because there has to be I mean I couldn't not include that and I think you know there are some re reviewers that have said oh I can you know I find it too difficult to read and but the, you know you have to balance out you know what what's authentic to the book and you know and actually it's not like I said it's not actually that historical the stuff that I've a lot of the stuff I've included is stuff that I know has happened a lot more recently so you know I try to tone it down as much as possible because I don't want to you know I mean the, the main plot is a murder mystery and a, and a love story I don't want to sort of take away from that but you know you have to also make it authentic and sometimes if you are writing about a difficult topic unfortunately there may just be readers that don't don't get on with it but I think I think that's okay I mean not every book is for every person so very true very true Holly I think to be honest compared to what you guys have already said I don't have anything particularly huge to say and I'm very wary that we only have a few minutes left so I don't want to take up everything. <laughs> Caroline did you have anything to add or? Um, not especially I think you guys have covered that really well. Um, so next question um, what is your favourite part of writing historical fiction? Thank you. Uh, for Louise Herr, but for all the other wonderful authors as well. Okay, let's start with Louise then. <laughs> um, I, I just really like create, recreating the world because the other option that I had is I like reading fantasy as well. And I was sort of torn whether to write fantasy or write historical. And actually one of the first things you start off with both genres is creating this world for yourself, for your characters. Um, and that's what I really enjoy. Like I'm writing about New York at the moment and sort of going into an, an absolute rabbit hole of an hour of what was the restaurant at Lord and Taylor like in the 1930s like that kind of like in-depth kind of research it's just it's just fun to sort of look at pictures online and and try and piece piece that world together and um and look at you know fashion and you know I could spend hours absolute hours <laughs> okay quick one sentence answer Polly um yeah getting lost down a rabbit hole in in researching it's just amazing but but not knowing what to get rid of that's that's the tricky one yeah true caroline um i think the same the research although i have quite a love hate relationship with it because um i love to write and sometimes i feel like the research can hold you up i just want to put words on a page but when you when i do stop and then do that research spend that time researching yeah it's just fascinating and it enriches your writing so much sorry that wasn't one sentence <laughs> <laughs> Francis what about you? Yeah same the research and, and as Caroline said it's a bit of a love hate you know you can have a lot of fun you might I might have to think oh my characters walking down the street they want a pie where would they find a nice pie what would it taste like that's fun and then there are those afternoons where you, know, you lose four hours to trying to find <coughs> out they had pockets in their trousers in the 17th century and then you can't find it and you just hope that no one else knows either but yeah it's really a lot of fun. I think you have to love the research. That is step one. Otherwise, yeah, write contemporary. Um, I think actually it, it's feeling the era and then imagining your characters in it and just like, yeah, I think is, is really fun. Um, okay, from Eleni. Uh, hello, how do you know when to stop researching and start writing? <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> um, I think I've changed as I've gone through my books because I think with my first one I just wrote, I just did way too much research and didn't start writing for ages. Um, and then, and then with my second one I did general research and then I did more detailed research as I went through writing. What about what about you, um, Caroline? Um, I think I start by doing a bit of general research to sort of formulate the ideas in my head of what direction I want to go in. Um, but then I really, like I said, I really just want to write. So I'll start writing and then a topic will pop up in that that I need to do more detailed research on. So I'll, I'll do it that way. I think if you do too much beforehand, what if I do too much beforehand, it just becomes a bit overwhelming and you need to figure out what your plot is first so you know what's relevant and what's not. 
Very good. I'm going to move on because we haven't got masses of time left. Um, so the next question from Hannah Evans, um, a classic writing question. Once you've done your research, how do you prefer to plan plot your novel? Do you scope it out scene by scene, write and see what happens as you go? Or do you have a different writing style? <laughs> Francis is laughing, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> well, I think we all do it differently. And I think what I've found is we do it differently for different books. So for the first book, my strategy was, I had a kind of vague overall idea, which very soon disappeared. <laughs> so I would plan a section until I got really, really bored with planning. And then I would write that section until I ran out of plan. And then I'd have to start planning again. And that's probably why it took me four years to write the book. So I wouldn't recommend that as a strategy. So second time round, I did a whole outline. But again, even if you do an outline, I think most of us stray from it when we write. So I think for, for a lot of people, it's a mixture of both, really. Yeah. And Louise, are you a plotter or a planner? No, um, but I'm getting better um so with this lovely city it the first draft was a mess everything was completely in the wrong place like structurally just oh uh, like terrible there was no tension it was just uh. so I had to literally start take it apart and start again so from that I did at least learn for the next couple of books that I've written since that I've been working on um to at least have I mean, when I talk at the same outline, I'm like, I've got five sentences, which is this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. No idea how or what's going to happen in between it. But, you know, I try and, if I start a chapter, I try and write down what I think might happen or where it will happen. But sometimes that goes off as well. So, but I kind of like how it, you know, if you sort of leave it open, you can go in these different directions and you're not tired. But I think having a few signposts along the way definitely helps to like, okay, by, I don't know, 20,000 words, this has to have happened. Otherwise I've gone way off. So I try and do it that way. So just, just have a, a plot to steer me back on, on yeah. track. Yeah, good. So a bit of a mixture basically. Um, and before we totally run out of time, um, Hayley Westwood says, I love this discussion about inclusivity. How much responsibility do you think publishers have to educate themselves on these topics? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> who wants to answer that? Anybody? Oh, that is a big question, isn't it? I'll, I'll start. Um, I think publishers and authors equally have that responsibility. And I think publishers and authors have been addressing it uh, a lot more in the last few years, uh, but there's obviously a way to go so yeah we're, we're getting there I suppose yeah anyone want to add to that I think publishers these days are very very keen to be inclusive so the trick is for them to get that message out there and and make people willing to submit novels that perhaps five years ago they thought might not get published I'm not saying there aren't still barriers I think there are I mean, I think probably anyone who's written about disability will be familiar with the tone down the disability argument. Um, but it's just a case of if people keep pushing and also if, if readers want to read it, at the end of the day, it's a market. So if people will pick up books about different kinds of people, then those books will get published. Yeah, I, I think um, I think that's a really good point, but I also think it's a bit of chicken and egg because if it's not published, people aren't going to be able to find them to to read them, um, and it's also about visibility. So there's, there's um, you know books published about all kinds of subjects, but they don't necessarily get to the shops or they don't get you know in front of people. So I think it's a really good point, and I think it is improving. But I think there's still a long, long way to go. I think it's it's also about um, having people who are, you know, from different minorities who are not in a book because they're from that minority. So, for example, having a disabled character who isn't there because they're disabled, that's not their job in the book. They just happen to be disabled. I think if we could see more of that, that would be a really positive move. In there. And there's very little of that. Yeah. And I also think that um, 
you know, it'd be great to have more diversity within publish the publishing industry itself. So people who are editors um, and agents and, you know, all, all the people who work in it, that would also help the situation too. Um, so, yeah, great. Well, um, I think have I answered all the questions. Sorry. Um, well, I think we're through with time. So thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in to watch and thank you to my lovely fellow panelists. And um, all that's left to say is have a really lovely evening and um, happy reading. <laughs> <laughs>